All right, welcome everybody. Um, this is Una Daly from CCCWR at uh, Open Education Global and welcome to uh, Open Ed Week 2021. I hope you've been enjoying some of the presentations. Um, there's really been some exciting ones so far and more to come. We've got a full week. Um, I did want to mention, um, I know uh, Paul is here, our, our executive director. And Paul, did you want to mention a little bit about Open Ed Week? I have a few statistics I can share, but. Um... Oh, sure. I'll, I'll just say a few quick words and then uh, welcome those statistics, Una. Um, well, so Open Education Week is an annual event that we've been doing for quite a few years now. And I think it serves as an incredibly awesome event in terms of gathering examples from around the world of what people are doing in open education and sharing them, not just in English, but in native languages from around the world. And, uh, and using this week as a, a means of uh, drawing people's attention to the, um, the impact open education is having and how it can be deployed and made use of in whatever context you're in, in whatever country. And, and in this way, I think it's just a great advocacy and awareness building um, week. And I'm delighted to see actually this year, the range of activities and the diverse participation from around the world. Great, yeah, Th thank you, Paul. And in fact, this is our eighth year eighth annual year of Open Ed Week, and it ke keeps growing each year. Um, you know, as Paul mentioned, um, very diverse. Um, we have, uh, and this was as of Sunday morning, I think, we had uh, 27 different countries contributing uh, both resources and online events, um, and 11 languages. And we usually get a few uh, over the weekend as well. So I suspect that those numbers will go up, but just to share with you the languages uh, that are represented, um, Catalan, Croatian, Dutch, English, French, German, Polish, Portuguese, Romanian, Slovenian, and Spanish. Um, and I know last year we had some Arabic ones as well, and I'm not sure if those are still coming, um, but um, this is really an opportunity for us to see uh, what uh, it's happening globally as well as as well as locally and um, so you came today to hear about regional leaders of open education phase two and, and we're just so thrilled to um, have you with us um, and this session is being recorded uh, so in case um, you have colleagues who who were unable to attend and I know several people contacted me so thank you very much Liz and next slide please So um, just briefly, I don't know if we'll go for the full hour today, actually, um, but I, of course, want to introduce our speakers. And then we're going to just give you an overview um, quickly of um, what's been going on for the last year and a half almost. Um, and on Arlo, so this there was a phase one and a very strong phase one. And I've got the leaders from that uh, group here to speak with you. And then we'll jump into phase two and um, kind of give you an outline. We're really at the very beginning of that, um, but how we see that moving forward and um, how you can get involved because we need your help and, and we want you to be part of this. All right, next slide, please. So um, very briefly, I'm just going to, our speakers today um, are Denise Cote from College of DuPage, and she led our Arlo policy work. Um, of course, I'm here from CCCOER. James Glappa Grossclang from College of the Canyons, who led our stewardship Arlo work. Uh, Amy Hofer from Open, it, Open Educational Resources. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, of course, the uh, person cutting my lawn has just turned up um, from Oregon Educational. Sorry, I, Amy, you might have to introduce yourself. It's Oregon Open Educational Resources, um, and who led our sustainability effort. Uh, we have Paul Stacy here with us, who you just heard from, the executive director of Open Ed Global. Quill West from Pierce College, um, Washington, who led our... Um, who led our professionalism, and Lisa Young from Maricopa Community College District, um, who is the co-president of CCCOER and was one of the uh, original um, creators and facilitators of the Arlo phase one. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. So for those of you who aren't, who aren't familiar with the CCCOAR mission, I'm going to turn this over to Lisa Young. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so the Community College Consortium for OER, our mission is um, quite expansive. We want to expand awareness and access to high quality open educational resources. We support faculty choice and development. We foster regional open educational resource leadership, and we improve student equity and success. We really are about developing an open community and working together to support one another. And we can go to the next slide, please. Um, we have membership in, in 34 states, um, which we have 90 members in the US and Canada, and we have 18 system-wide memberships. Um, and so um, the map there shows you where our members are, and um, we're still working on building our membership and we'll continue to support um, OER at community colleges um, and hope to get more institutions on board. Um, if we can go to that next slide. And so with our Arlo group, it really was about a call for collaboration. And so as you have seen, and, and as we've all seen over the last decade, um, the open educational movement, it really is, it's transforming into a professional field. There are people are have, have um, positions at institutions as with their job being around open educational resources. And as we look to, um, to, to solidify Oh, the open educational movement into a profession. We're really working um, to build our next generation of leaders and really help um, support open education as a profession and engage leaders in this conversation. And so um, with that, you know, Arlo is a huge piece of this really creating this professional field. And with that, I think I turn it back over to you, Una. Thanks, Liz, for the next slide. So the regional leaders of open education, as um, as Lisa said, was around bringing, um, bringing people uh, together around open education uh, now that it is really being built into a professional um, organization and set of roles. And so Arlo was formed really to, to bring this forward and to encourage collaboration across institutional and state boundaries. There's so much that we can learn from each other. Um, there's um, common issues come up when leading OER programs um, and, how, and looking to others who have done this kind of work in the past um, and have already made those mistakes. So uh, sharing what, what works and what doesn't and eliminating duplicate efforts. And so our focus was around uh, four areas, sustainability of open education, policy and strategy, stewardship uh, um, of open educational resources and, uh, and the people who do the work and also professionalism. So what are the different roles um, that are available now in this new space? And um, leaders from colleges, universities, library consortia, government agencies were invited to participate in these four work groups uh, to discuss and build solutions. And there were four leaders who I introduced earlier who are going to tell you more about that. For those of you who um, maybe didn't participate in phase one uh, with these four groups, um, there was a, <clears throat> a a, a wonderful presentation at Open Education Global. And there's a link to that um, in these slides. Um, and you can go and listen to that presentation and look at the slides for that um, and find out more about what happened in phase one, um, because we, we're not gonna have the time to go into all of that detail today, um, but um, it, there's been some wonderful work done and it's well worth uh, hearing about that. So next slide. And I think we're gonna turn this over to Amy Hofer who led our sustainability effort. Hi, um, I'll just give a really quick um, intro to what the sustainability work group 
did. And I see a bunch of folks that are here that were part of the work group. So thank you. Um, and we started from David Wiley's definition, which is that sustainability will be defined as an open educational resource project's ongoing ability to meet its goals. So we assumed that everybody will have different goals and sustainability will mean something different depending on your own environment. And we really focused in on um, how we can encourage open education to be sustainable by being really integrated into commitments that our institutions have already made. Um, and of course, that's gonna look different at different places. Um, we created a sustainability guide and I can put that link in the chat. Um, we gathered you know, different examples of um, resources um, from the open education community that we think are um, exemplars of this approach to really um, integrating open education into workflows and processes that we already do. And then we wrote a guide to sort of provide some context around those examples. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And I'm seeing um, many of her team members here uh, singing her praises and um, Amy and her team were amazing. And the sustainability guide that um, I know she's gonna share with us in the a link to that in the chat is really a very comprehensive um, set of guidelines um, for leading um, OER. All righty, uh, next slide, please, Liz. All right, and next I wanna turn this over to um, Quill West who led our professionalism of the open educator uh, work group. Hello, everybody. Um, so uh, the professional, and I think we can skip to the next slide, Liz, when you're ready. Um, my name is Quill West and I'm the Open Education Project Manager. Um, oh, maybe not. <laughs> um, so my, um, our central question of the professionalism group was how do we invite new people to this profession? How do they learn what they need to learn to carry forward both our ethics, um, but also, um, make the work accessible and successful at their institutions. So um, a big part of our work was building the open education matrix, which um, the idea behind the matrix was to define what competencies people need in the profession and then how they go about finding those competencies. So um, an early version of our work is published on the website that I just posted into the chat. Um, and I am looking forward to seeing what happens next. And I want to thank there are some people in the session who contributed heavily to this work. So I want to say thanks to everybody who was a part of um, Arlo Phase One. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Quill. And um, I know that um, Quill's uh, work and her team's work is being used. Um, by a larger group that's looking at professional development across the whole open education space. So this work is, is, is really going to live on, uh, not only in phase two of Arlo, but um, is being used um, with other groups as well. Um, I'm actually going to share a link here. This is... Um, oops. Um, because um, this is a link to um, the presentation that occurred uh, last November um, at Open Education Global, and it includes the slides um, that I think Quill was referring to, and also um, the slides that everyone else in this uh, group presented on um, back in November. So you don't have to wait till, uh, till you get the slides. All right, next slide, please, Liz. All right, and next I wanna introduce uh, Dr. Denise Cote um, at, from College of DuPage who led our policy and strategy work group. Hi everybody, um, I'm gonna leave my camera off. I'm not fit to be seen right now. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, I led the uh, policy group. So what we did was um, we reached out to the people who run the OER world map um, and they have a little policy hub. It's a secondary, well, not secondary, it's an offshoot of the um, world map. So I, we thought it was a great idea to try to get our um, the United States policy documents into that database. So um, I worked with them a lot and we identified um, a few states that would be pilots for us. 
and we worked with them. And then um, we worked a lot on refining um, and aligning um, our interests to the um, the database master spec, which is you know what it, the database the index is built on. Um, so I created a couple of job aids for people to be able to do this themselves. And um, I'm hoping that um, in the coming weeks and months, we'll be able to um, promote participation um, along with um, the people who are working on the world map who are um, in Italy and in England and all over the world. So it was really cool to work with them. But I was wondering if I could share my screen or I can just put the link to the um, job aids that we created into the chat. Let me see if I can do that. Okay, so a little bit, bit a little bitly there. I don't know if we have time to go through them or if you wanted me to go through them, Una, but um, they're there. Um, there's one on how to create your own profile, very simple. And then another that um, really goes into depth on how to create a good record um, I also made um, field descriptions, each one of the field descriptions um, that would be used in the index and to match them up to what um, United States users um, would be interested in. Um, and um, there's some terminology differences uh, globally. So, um, and I went through every single one of the um, areas of the master spec and matched it up with what the United States um, what United States users would search on. So um, yeah, and so we're getting there. We have a couple of states in Colorado and Texas. Um, and I'm hoping that people will um, step up and start trying to put some in and that we'll be able to provide support um, for those people. So. Great, thank you, Denise. And, and thank you for sharing that link to the guides. Um, and it, it was really exciting to see um, both Colorado and Texas um, submit their policies. And um, I'm not sure if we have Kyla Torre from, uh, she's from the Higher Education Board in Texas and Spencer Ellis um, from Colorado um, Higher Ed Association. I think I got that correct. <laughs> Who um, shared their, their the great work that's going on in OER in, in both of those states. And uh, we know that there's many more of you out there. So thank you so much, Denise, for leading this work. All right, next one. All right. Uh, last but not least, James Clappa Grossclag, who led the stewardship uh, program, uh, sorry, work group at uh, for Arlo. James? Yeah, th thank you, Una. Thanks very much. I just want to start off by, by echoing what Lisa mentioned at the beginning. Uh, you know, as, as the open education movement, you know, evolves into a proper professional field, it's so important that we who are active in the field are defining for ourselves uh, what we want that field to look like and we're not leaving that to others. Uh, so next slide please. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the, the work of many, many people who are involved in, in uh, the stewardship work group. Um, and in particular, a shout out to Andy McKinney, uh, Nathan Smith, and Judith Sebesta who uh, were the ones who who ultimately actually had their hands on a text, you know, we're, we're, we're helping to write. So uh, we start off by asking, what is stewardship? You know, what are, what are we actually talking about? You see the definition here, stewardship is an ethic that embodies the responsible planning and management of resources like open educational resources. And it's generally recognized as the acceptance or assignment of responsibility to shepherd and safeguard. Uh, so it's kind of a big responsibility if we're thinking about being stewards. And if, if we in the open education world uh, want to be stewards, what does that mean? We'll go to the next slide. So these are kind of the thorny questions that we asked. Um, we started by building on the terrific work done by colleagues on the, um, the CARE framework. And you see the reference to the CARE framework in the lower right of this slide. Uh, that was written by Lisa Petrides, Doug Levin, and Edward Watson and published back in 2017, I want to say. Uh, 2000, yeah, 2017. Um, 18. 18, 18, thank you. 2018, it was in Niagara Falls, the, when the Open Ed Conference was in Niagara Falls. So, um, uh, so we built on that and, uh, and we're in conversation with those authors. Uh, we're doing this work very respectfully, um, building on, on their original uh, care framework. And I think we all 
when we dug into this work, we all recognized that uh, the world changes, things evolve, times move on, and, and new new things, new concerns appear on the scene. So uh, we organized our, our work, our questioning around the topics you see here on the left-hand slide, le left-hand side of the slide, labor, inclusion, privacy, and consent. Uh, you'll see from the questions there, I think they're pretty thorny questions. You know, if, if we are stewards, if we open educators want to say that we're stewards, then how do we support and seek appropriate compensation who are contributing, like the adjuncts and contingent labor in, in so much of higher education? And uh, how do we promote inclusion? How do we as good stewards promote in, in conclusion contributions by people who have historically been excluded from uh, contributing knowledge or producing knowledge that's formally recognized. Um, and as good stewards, how do we consider uses of privacy, uh, especially data and surveillance with the platforms that utilize our OER, if we create OER and we release it under a CC by license and then, you know, this, uh, you know, not to be named publishing company scoops it up and uses that to lure students into their so surveillance apparatus. What do we what do we do about that? And then closely related is the question of consent. Uh, as we uh, leverage the, the the benefits of open pedagogy, uh, for example, and students students and others outside of the traditional academy are creating content. How do we recognize uh, their uh, right to give informed consent to what happens to their content? So those are the big questions. Um, the uh, end, end result will be a document, a uh, document that is in dialogue with or building on the original care, care framework. So stay tuned for that document and we will circulate it widely when we have that. So thanks, Una. Back to you. Thank you, James. And um, yeah, it is really exciting the work that uh, James's group was doing as well, and, and um, the engagement from the um, original authors of the CARE framework and, and how they uh, really want to move forward together uh, with Arlo. So really excited about that. And now we're going to turn to Arlo phase two, and um, I'm going to let Paul speak here for a moment. Um, and all I wanted to say is that Paul and I started talking about this, I think, late last spring and saying, you know, uh, we need to be thinking about what comes next. And um, so Paul started the conversation uh, with um, some now friends and colleagues at the ECMC Foundation. So I'm gonna turn it over to Paul to talk, speak about that. Yeah, thanks, Una. Um, well, as Una mentions, um, we thought the Arlo work was just incredible. and. We're so thankful actually for the efforts everyone put into making it such a success and wanted to see it continue and be built out from there. And as the pandemic took hold last year, um, ECMC's uh, president actually published a blog post saying, hey, education is being disrupted. Um, this is a good time to think about systemic change. If anyone's got ideas related to that, get in, get in touch with me. So I wrote him personally and suggested that open education might work for them as a means of enabling systemic change. And then Una and I were put in touch with one of their program officers and encouraged to develop a proposal. And we chose the Arlo program as being a proposal or an effort that needed or could be built out further and deserved some additional funding. Um, and just so maybe just quickly to say a word about the ECMC Foundation. Um, this is actually a new foundation in terms of um, serious big investments in open education. They've made some smaller investments in, uh, in some of their own institution work, but this is really their first big foray into open education. So we were, we're kind of thrilled actually to have um, another foundation start to get involved in our work. And for those of you that are not familiar with them, uh, the ECMC Foundation is based in Los Angeles and it's a national foundation that works to improve post-secondary outcomes for students, primarily from underserved backgrounds. And it, it has two investment areas of focus. One is college success and the other is career readiness. Uh, the Arlo grant was uh, made in the college success area, uh, which is focused on increasing the number of college students from historically underrepresented backgrounds, including those that are coming from low income, 
and those for whom uh, higher education is like a first generation activity. Um, and they're basically looking to find ways to help them pursue and attain bachelor's degrees. And so that's a, a little bit. So we were, uh, we actually spent quite a bit of time going uh, back and forth with the, with our program officer there to develop this proposal, uh, which went to their board earlier this year. And we were just thrilled to, to successfully get this grant. Back to you, Una, to describe it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Liz, next slide, please. All right. So phase two, we're really building a network of regional leaders. Um, so it's not the informal program of the first year or so. Um, and what we envision is that this is a two year cycle. Uh, we hope that it's an ongoing one, um, but uh, the initial one is a, is a um, two year cycle with three different cohorts that will um, move through, uh, first of all, an upfront intensive and interactive training experience or learning experience around focused on our four areas of sustainability, stewardship, professionalism, and policy. Um, and after they go through that experience, uh, there will be ongoing professional development throughout this period, um, including monthly webinars, um, uh, etc. Uh, there will be regular check-in with coaches. So there'll be coaches that um, will, will be matched with the participants uh, and they will work in peer groups as well. Um, so uh, it, within their cohort. And um, there also will be a network platform so that there can be asynchronous anytime support between peers. Um, so that's kind of the big picture. Um, and uh, next slide, Liz. So the target audience, um, as, as it was in, um, in uh, phase one, is uh, state and provincial leaders at community colleges, four-year colleges and universities, state and system education offices, uh, library consortia, and um, government agencies. And we anticipate that there will be three application periods uh, for the three cohorts. Um, and we hope to uh, accept 30 to 40 per cohort. Um, and as part of that application process, you will um, share uh, strategic plans to be implemented during the program duration. Um, and because this program uh, um, is really focused on helping you move forward at the um, institutional and state uh, regional level, um, it's very important that um, you have support from within your institution so that you have permission essentially to do this work and that uh, you've got um, some support behind you to um, help help through this period. Um, let me see. Paul, I'm wondering if I'm forgetting something here. Uh, anything no, you would like? To... Keep going. Okay. okay. <laughs> There was some, there's something tickling in the back of my mind that I'm forgetting to say, but okay. Next slide, please, Liz. All right. So um, once again, kind of diving into the professional development piece, um, I think when we originally uh, envisioned this back in spring, summer, <laughs> we thought, hey, the pandemic will be over by then. <laughs> No problem. Uh, so, you know, we'll have these workshops. We'll have intensive, you know, probably two and a half day workshops in person. Uh, everybody interacting, you know, uh, with learning facilitators and coaches on site. Well, <laughs> we're not so sure about that now. <laughs> and we also know that a virtual uh virtual access is going to give this as a possibility for more people. So we haven't quite decided what exactly that format will look like, but it's likely, it's at least in our first cohort, uh, to be a virtual cohort uh, through a course. There'll be some asynchronous and some synchronous components, and probably over um, like a four-week period is my is our guess, um, and where um, folks are really um, engaged in an interactive process around diving into those four Arlo pillars. Now the output after that interactive intensive experience is uh, that they are taking their plans and creating their objectives and activities for achieving and measuring these goals. 
and um, and then during after they have uh, done that, um, then there will be ongoing monthly webinars. Uh, there will also be um, a coaching sessions and peer groups will continue to meet separately as well. Um, and we also have um, some specialists. Um, so people who will focus directly on one of the four areas who will also be available for co consultation and mentoring. Next slide, please, Liz. <clears throat> so just to give you a little bit more uh, background on the, um, the mentoring and peer support. So each participant will join a cohort of leaders. And um, as we originally envisioned this and still see this as, as, as the way forward is that we were going to um, divide the three cohorts by geographical location. So there would be a, um, I'm going to start from the West Coast, but sorry, that's because where I'm located. So there'd be a West Coast cohort, a uh, Midwestern or Central, I, I should say Central uh, cohort, and then there would be an East Coast cohort um, that would run through on separate uh, separate intensive um, uh, training periods. Um, they would all be in the same network, but they would they would have a, sort of a, in terms of their coaches, um, the coaches would be specifically focused on certain cohorts. And um, each participant, I wouldn't necessarily be assigned a coach, but there will be some matching process between the coach and the participants uh, so that they could meet regularly to review their strategic plans, answer questions. And then peer groups will continue to meet uh, regularly and share their knowledge and lessons learned with each other. Um, and that will be ongoing throughout the two years um, of that. And next slide, please, Liz. Mm, all right. <laughs> so I know that's a broad stroke overview. If there's any questions uh, before we come to what the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve with this, and that we hope um, also that you will engage and see the positive side of, um, I, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, well, while we're waiting for questions, um, I think I was going to turn this over to Paul to talk about the outcomes that we hope to achieve. Sure. Thanks, Luna. So as you might expect with an initiative like this and with, uh, with a kind of two-year funding for a project like this, we need to measure, we need to establish and measure some outcomes. And obviously, one of the big outcomes is that a, a network of open education leaders who are collaborating with each other across regional boundaries is established. And we think that that peer to peer kind of network, in, and really including the coaches and mentors and everyone, is really a fantastic outcome of this because it provides that sort of mutual support for the, the implementation of open education initiatives. Um, we were actually, um, in, in defining some measurable outcomes, we, we um, added one around student participation. So as Una mentioned, um, participants will, will develop a strategic plan for an open education initiative at their institution. And one of the measures that we are looking to um, have as part of this program is that students themselves are consulted as part of that strategic plan around the open education initiative, and then are actively involved in its in its implementation. Uh, we think this is a really um, important and uh, significant outcome, uh, which is, which kind of helps raise awareness across the student body about what open education is all about. And um, we're obviously looking as well to ensure that the strategic plans that participants bring for their open education initiatives actually get implemented and result in ongoing sustainable open education initiatives taking place at these institutions. And that includes uh, policies, practices, support for professional development, uh, grant programs that incentivize people to participate and engage in this work, and some, some, um, some policies around stewardship of how they'll manage and grow their open education initiative over time. Um, we, the, and these are really just like, there's actually quite a number of outcome measures, if I remember right, Una. So we've got a nice summary here, but, but um, 
we are also expecting to see professional development opportunities be offered to staff and faculty and, uh, and others at institutions as part of these open education initiatives and, and are, are eager to kind of show how that plays out. And then because this is about open education, there's uh, an expectation that um, open education resources in the form of course materials and other things will get created and that as part of these open education initiatives, there'll be a commitment to license and make those resources available to others and manage them going forward as part of the stewardship. Um, we could probably go on with other measures, but this gives you a sort of snapshot of some of the key measures that are intended to be accomplished through this program. Great. Thank you, Paul. And um, we, we did have um, a good question here from James. And I know, Paul, you've had to answer this one before, so maybe I'll turn it to you. Um, is there something, uh, is this something that an institution can send a team to, uh, or is it more for individuals? Oh, it's a great question, James. Um, I think we were hoping to have it be primarily um, one representative from an institution, just in order to maximize the breadth of impact. Obviously, though, having said that, um, when, when a strategic plan is being developed, we would expect that to be done in a team-based fashion at the institution so that um, you know, the participant as well as students and others are actively involved in that. But in terms of coming and taking the RLO network um, offering itself, uh, we would prefer to see one person per institution in order to get the breadth of, of impact across the, the, um, the country as much as possible. Yeah. Um... Yeah, thank you, Paul. And I do think it, uh, to some extent, it may be based, we, we will consider, depending on what the uh, demand is, to allow more than, than one per, per institution. So, um, I, so stay tuned on that. But I, yeah, in, in general, I agree with what Paul had to say. It's just that um, th there can be obviously some great positives from teamwork um, as well. All right, next slide, please, Liz. Um, so um, we we are still kind of in the process of really getting this um, going, um, and um, so we received the grant about a month ago, and so we were very excited about that. We've been kind of putting things in place, but we need your help, and we hope that you'll be part of this. Um, and so one thing that we've done is we've actually posted a couple of job um, offerings. One is a program manager who will be more of the day-to-day hands-on. Uh, for this, and then also a curriculum developer and learning facilitator. So um, please check those out if you haven't had a chance to. They're also posted on the OE Global website, went out on our email list. Um, and then we're also looking for specialists and coaches within um, our community. Um, of course, we um, have a set of wonderful leaders who worked with us last year and, uh, and their work groups, and we'd love to have those folks um, participate in that way as well if they decide to. So in the interim, while we're doing all that work, and thank you so much, Liz, for putting all those in there for us. Um, we have created a survey, a little Google form, to, to find out about your interest and how you might want to participate, uh, particularly if you're not applying directly for one of those jobs, but if you might be interested in being a specialist or a coach, um, or if, in fact, you might want to participate as one of the cohort members. So please, when you get a chance, it's a real short survey, uh, fill that out and let us know. And we're going to be adding all of you to an email list along with our existing Arlo folks so that we can let you know as different um, events come up, um, because we'll be coming back to you to talk and, and tell you where we're at um, in another month or so um, and getting folks excited about this next stage. Um, and I think next slide, Liz. And I want to turn this over to Liz, our communities manager, who manages all of all of our wonderful technology and makes this possible. Thanks, Una. So, um, as you can see, as you all know, this week we have um, Open Education Week. Um, next, our next monthly webinar will be on um, K through 12 and community college collaboration on OER. Um, May 12th is professional development. Um, and then June 9th, we're still working out 
probably going to be something around anti-racism. Uh, and for the rest of Open Education Week, so we have another um, live webinar tomorrow. Um, it's a student panel uh, with um, students from Massachusetts talking about how they've been working to increase OER awareness. And just note that that is at 9 a.m. Pacific, um, oh, it should be 12 p.m. Eastern, <laughs> sorry about that, it is uh, three hours earlier than our usual um, programs. And then um, Thursday and Friday will be asynchronous um, events. Thursday we'll have discussions around open pedagogy and equity, and we're gonna encourage people to share resources. And on Friday, we're talking about OER leadership, in particular, um, the CCC OER Executive Council and um, some OE Global positions as well. And Liz, before you move on to the next slide, do you want to tell people a little bit about the OEG Connect platform? Because that's something new this year with Open Ed Week. OK, yes. Yeah. So if any of you attended the Open Education Global Conference, you know that we used an, a new um, forum that um, that um, Open Education Global developed last year. So it's a discourse um, uh, forum. And um, so we know a lot of conversations go on Twitter, but if you want an alternate um, place to, to host things and have conversations, um, anyone interested in open education can sign up um, and for OE Global. And you can find the link to that at the Open Education Week um, website. And thanks to Quill for sharing it in the chat window. <laughs> oh, thank you, Quill. OK. And then um, just a few things on how to stay in the loop. So on our website under Get Involved, we have a link to a spreadsheet with upcoming conferences. Um, you can also join our community email. Probably most people here are already on it. And um, we have a lot of um, case studies also, case studies and student stories and um, thought pieces on our blog. Okay, I think that's it for me. Thanks so much, Liz. So we are open for questions. Um, you can um, it, yeah, unmic, I'm sorry, unmute <laughs> your mic. You can unmic yourself too, whatever that means. And uh, just ask questions. Well, I assume if you're not asking questions and you're busy filling out that survey <laughs> about your interest level. All right, sorry, I'm being silly here, but um, any, any other thoughts? Surely, James, you're never at a loss for words. You got anything else to say? <laughs> sorry, oh, well, I picked on James because he and I work together so closely. Thank you, friend. Um, <clears throat> actually, <laughs> I do have a question, maybe a clarifying question for the audience. If someone wanted to participate, be a participant in this, or bring this bring this opportunity to their to their colleagues, and, and they're planning ahead, when would it, when when would a, somebody actually participate? When would the program begin? Is that yeah? Thank you, James. That's a great question. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So um, we are uh, hoping to open the application for the um, for the first cohort in June, and that probably the first intensive training would be in the August timeframe. So um, we will be working on the development up to, up till then, but um, we will we will be having some um, consistent webinars um, and and kind of synchronous get togethers so people can provide input and ask questions as we move along through this process. Thank you, Una. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining us, Amy. And Amy's got a great event going on in starting in 15 minutes uh, as part of Open Ed Week. And you can see that in the chat window. And um, Thank you, Una. Thank you, Denise. I want to thank, um, you know, particularly our four stalwart, amazing um, Arlo phase one leaders. And I know that um, 
I hope that they participate with us, but I know that they'll be there in spirit at any rate. Um, and I know that um, quite a number of you were on their work groups and um, we are looking forward to you um, participating and helping us to get this off the ground um, in phase two. And I don't wanna miss that there's a question in the chat from Sophia. Oh. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so, Sophia, you asked, could you explain a little bit more on the Arlo interest group? So, um, so I'm sorry if I was confusing, um, Sophia. It's, it's the Arlo network, the Regional Leaders of Open Education Network. Um, it's the interest survey. So <laughs> that survey that I put in, and Liz, maybe you can go back to that slide please. Um, and um, we, we simply wanted to know if you would like to hear about these announcements um, it, for these upcoming synchronous events as we talk about the program as it develops. Um, we'd like to keep you um, informed, but if people don't want to be on that list, you know, we don't want to just blast it out um, all the time to people. But for those who are interested in attending these um, synchronous events, um, we We'd love to have include you. So if you fill out that Arlo interest form for us, uh, we'll know what your interest level is. Does that does that help, Sophia? Great, thank you. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Paul and Liz and. And um, I hope you all have a great rest of your open ed week. We look forward to seeing you online.